Okay, let's begin. Um, so we'll begin the public comment session section of um, our uh, meeting today. Uh, so let me begin by saying that uh, at the very beginning, I'd like to welcome and thank all of our public comment speakers uh, for addressing the uh, voting uh, members in the committee today. Um, your thoughts and your comments are important to us. Um, all of the speakers today submitted a, a request in advance of the meeting. Um, and the final list of public commenters was determined uh, via a lottery. Uh, for the speakers, um, I want to point out that we have uh, limited time for public comment. Um, and in order to make it through the entire list, um, it's very, very important that uh, each speaker limits his or her comments to three minutes. Um, there will be a, a timer on, on your screens uh, that will cycle through uh, three colors and then announce that your time has expired. Um, at that point, I will uh, state thank you for your comment. Your time has expired. If you exceed that time by 15 seconds, I will uh, state as a courtesy to other speakers, we ask that you conclude your comment. And if you go for, ha for half a minute after your time, um, you will hear me say your comment uh, time has ended. Thank you and your microphone will be cut. So I'll begin now with the list of speakers. <clears throat> And um, I ask that each speaker uh, please um, uh, state their name and their affiliation uh, prior to making their comments. The first speaker is Jeanette Contreras. Uh, Ms. Contreras, please go forward. Good afternoon. I'm Jeanette Contreras here today on behalf of the National Consumers League. For over 120 years, our organization has advocated for vaccines as a safe and effective means to prevent disease. We extend our gratitude to this committee for the opportunity to present public comments. As consumer advocates, we applaud the transparency and access afforded to the public throughout the COVID-19 vaccine approval process. We are encouraged that the FDA has approved the Moderna vaccine and that the U.S. government will lead distribution efforts. Due to its ease of transport and storage, the Moderna vaccine stands to readily ship to rural and hard-to-reach communities. NCL calls on federal officials at the helm of distribution to facilitate access to the Moderna vaccine in medically underserved areas. We have great trust in the FDA and CDC's robust interagency collaboration to continue ongoing post-market surveillance of adverse events among recipients of the vaccine and to inform consumers of any additional safety recommendations. NCL urges the CDC to educate consumers about potential reactions and side effects as this transparency will further encourage compliance necessary to achieve herd immunity. The vaccine is expected to induce flu-like symptoms after the initial dose, and this may deter some patients from getting their second dose if they aren't warned about what to anticipate. To address vaccine adherence, we encourage the CDC to conduct culturally competent public education about vaccine safety to ensure that communities of color and persons with limited English proficiency are informed and feel empowered in their decisions to vaccinate. Adding to the complexity of administering the vaccine, public health officials will need to ensure the completion of two doses in a series. This tends to create additional challenges as evidence has shown that when a vaccine involves multiple doses, nearly 50% of patients fail to return for a second dose. We applaud the committee's recommendations to prioritize vaccinations for healthcare workers and long-term care facility residents in phase 1A. Now that there are two approved vaccines, we encourage ACIP to prioritize recommendations to vaccinate the 87 million non-healthcare essential workers unable to work from home, such as bus drivers and grocery workers who are at higher risk for exposure. Racial and ethnic minorities make up more than 40% of the essential workforce and are the backbone to many essential industries. The pandemic has illustrated that low-income minority communities experience more severe COVID-related illness requiring hospitalization and are at higher risk for death from COVID-19. Lastly, over 17.5 million individuals in the U.S. have been infected with the coronavirus. It is expected that those who recover will acquire some natural immunity. Individuals who recover from the coronavirus want to know if they are protected from reinfection and for how long. We call on the CDC to expedite developing vaccine recommendations for persons who've recovered from the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, who've recovered from COVID-19. Thank you for your consideration of our views on this important public health issue. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Karen Ernst. Ms. Ernst. Thank you. 
My name is Karen Ernst, and I am the director of Voices for Vaccines. I represent everyday families who look to your guidance to lead us out of this pandemic. First, I want to mention briefly that I was dismayed that the legitimacy of the CDC continues to be used by anti-vaxxers for information laundering to spread spurious claims about vaccine harms into public discourse. But really what I'm here to say is this, when can I get the vaccine? That's the number one question I'm receiving on a day-to-day -day basis. Of course, people are concerned what the fast delivery of these vaccines might mean as far as safety. And ACIP can do a great service by explaining exactly how well studied the safety of any COVID-19 vaccine is. But even people with concerns are saying, you go first, but can I go second? As much as I would personally love to be in line for a vaccine right now, I want to encourage ACIP to stress the importance of following CDC guidance in prioritizing vulnerable people. Both public health and the public need a clear vision of why vulnerable people need a place at the front of the line and encouragement for the rest of us to continue wearing our masks and keeping our distance. Of course, prioritizing is one thing, but getting the vaccine into the arms of the most vulnerable people requires, requires stripping logistical barriers to vaccination such as transportation, paid leave for vaccination, post-vaccination, childcare. These are just a few of the ways that we can make immunization more accessible. And I want to end by saying thank you. Thank you to all the public health and healthcare folks who have been working overtime for the past year, who understand that there are stories behind the numbers and who have brought us to an incredible moment in history where we have two safe, effective vaccines for a disease most of us never heard of a year ago. Take a minute to really soak in what an amazing point in history this is and the incredible job that every single one of you has played in it, no matter how large or small. Thank you so much. Greetings, Advisory Committee on Administration Practices. Um, my name is Maria Perales Sanchez, and I'm with Centro de los Derechos del Migrante, the first transnational migrant workers' rights organization based in Mexico and the U.S. We're also a co-founding member of Alianza Nacional de Campesinas, serving over 700,000 farm worker women and families nationwide. For over 15 years, we have worked with thousands of food and farm workers. These are seafood workers in processing plants poultry processors, and agricultural workers. During the pandemic, they have rightfully received the title of essential worker. However, workers report to us that they are not receiving the necessary enforceable protection to be safe at their workplace. I'm here today to emphasize the need for these workers to be explicitly and unequivocally prioritized for vaccine allocation and CDC guidance. For context, Workers in this industry face a disproportionate risk of contracting the virus. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began, at least 125,000 farm workers have contracted the virus. With workers in this industry being low-wage workers of color, we suspect the numbers are even higher across this industry. Pre-existing working conditions such as retaliation, little access to equipment and tools, discrimination in cramped working conditions makes these workers more vulnerable to the coronavirus. According to the CDC COVID-19 vaccination program playbook, vaccine allocation is at the discretion of state and local jurisdictions. Yet, from our work, we know that these jurisdictions heavily rely on and look to the CDC for guidance on immunization practices when making this decision. The issue we raise today is that farm workers and food supply workers are not explicitly referenced in the more relevant CDC vaccination guidance or the OSHA hazard recognition tool that classifies the risk worker exposure to SARS-CoV-2. These are two guidances the state and local officials reference for vaccine allocation. This is a great public health concern and one about equity, because while we know that farm and food workers are bearing some of the highest risk, the lack of peer mention in this guidance makes it easier to neglect them in vaccine allocation. We hear from workers every day. As breadwinners with some of the lowest wages and workplace protections, 
They are forced to remain in hazardous working conditions. We urge you to specifically reference and designate food chain supply workers, such as farm workers, poultry workers, and seafood processing plant workers as priority in CDC vaccination guidance, and to encourage OSHA to list these workers in their risk assessment tool. We thank you for your time and thank you for standing with workers. Thank you. Hi, this, this is. This um, next, next speaker is Ms. Claire Hannon. Hi, this is Claire Hannon, Executive Director of the Association of Immunization Managers. Our nonprofit represents the state, territorial, and large urban area public health immunization programs. I first wish to thank the CDC and members of the advisory committee for their ongoing guidance, commitment to the principles of safety, inclusiveness, efficiency, and flexibility, and for the open, transparent meetings. It's quite an exceptional development that we now have two vaccines to fight this terrible pandemic. And although we do have difficult choices to make while the vaccines are in short supply, we must remember to keep this in context and understand that these decisions, while difficult, are life-saving and good. Every day that we vaccinate even one person should be viewed as a success. The dilemma facing jurisdictions and the pressure on governors and public health agencies cannot be minimized. This pandemic has impacted so many different individuals, some disproportionately harder than others, and so many workers have become essential. It's critical that we listen to and engage with all of these stakeholders, but it is simply not possible to put all of them at the front of the line. The guidance provided by ACIP is extremely valuable and will help jurisdictions make decisions. The balanced considerations for preventing death and supporting societal function help provide context to the phased rollout. Prioritizing frontline essential workers and those over 75 with it fits with the intentions of many awardees. The implementation challenges with these groups will require an array of public and private providers and diverse vaccination strategies. And I would just like to emphasize that policing or enforcement of priority groups is not feasible. The guidance on transitioning between phases is especially helpful because some jurisdictions will move faster than others based simply on the need to keep vaccine from sitting on the shelf. As much guidance and justification as can be provided is needed, particularly communication strategies and talking points. Especially needed is messaging and guidance on vaccinating in congregate settings for incarcerated individuals and the homeless, and the prioritization of essential workers who are young and healthy over adults at high risk due to underlying conditions. And I agree that for planning purposes, a vote on phase 1B and 1C is needed today. I would be remiss if I did not once again call out the dire need for federal funding to support public health vaccine planning and response. The challenges related to equitable distribution of these vaccines continue to come. And with larger allocations, larger prioritized populations, and large vaccination opportunity, public health finds its role and responsibilities growing while its ability to hire, to respond, to plan, diminished by lack of resources. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hello, my name is Kim, and I'm speaking as a daughter and granddaughter of seniors at high risk for COVID. These elders in my family are part Vietnamese, Filipino, Indonesian, and Persian communities, and as such are strongly guided by cultural values. One of those family values is family-based care as they age and become frail. We take care of our elders. It's also out of necessity when the system doesn't meet their needs. But home care also makes it easy for them to be invisible to the system. My parents and grandmother need access to the vaccine, but I'm concerned about government plans that rely on formal access points like congregate care adults, congregate care settings, or adult family homes. My grandmother in particular fits the priority population, elderly, high risk of mortality, receiving nursing home care level, and she lives in an area with disproportionate infection rates. However, she can't get the vaccine access because she's not in a facility and doesn't fall into the categories in the state plan, which includes skilled nursing, assisted living, and adult family homes, HUD 202, low-income housing, and vets homes. In short, because she isn't in the system, 
she isn't connected to any of the touch points to be reached. I know there are community organizations that serve our communities who are known and trusted, but they need to be elevated and funded to do the work of reaching and assisting elders like my parents and grandparents. Please think about these specific populations as you deliberate how to prioritize vaccine distribution. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I want to remind uh, the uh, list of public speakers not to begin speaking until I call your name. Um, we are trying to go sequentially in a list that has been provided uh, by um, uh, our uh, uh, assistants. So uh, please wait until I call your names. Um, I believe our next speaker is Mario Apau. Dr. Romero, that was her, that was Kim Apau. So the next speaker will be Jocelyn Hybisk. Sorry if I said that wrong. Thank you. Jocelyn Hybisky, and I'm here, yes. Please go forward. All right, my name is Jocelyn Hybisky. I am a professional medical writer and volunteer vaccine advocate. I have no relevant conflict of interest to declare. I want to first acknowledge the tremendous effort and dedication that has brought us here today to have vaccines developed and authorized for emergency use within the same year as the onset of a pandemic. Now that we have these effective vaccines in our arsenal, we must deploy them as efficiently as possible to prevent lives lost to COVID-19. The immediate hurdle is, of course, access. We are only a week into phase 1A, and we've already seen that the number of doses is not the only limiting factor. Logistical challenges such as ultra cold storage and a 975 dose minimum order for the Pfizer vaccine have already caused imbalances among the first group of vaccine recipients. Healthcare workers in smaller hospitals and clinics, particularly in rural areas, are effectively deprioritized compared to their counterparts in large hospitals. Inequitable access has occurred even within the same practice whereby physicians who are co-affiliated with a large hospital were able to access the vaccine while non-physician staff were not, despite having the same high-risk designation. Although authorization of the Moderna vaccine with more manageable storage and ordering logistics will alleviate some of these issues, these real-world examples highlight barriers to equity access early in the distribution process. The logistical challenges will only worsen as recipient groups expand. I hope the ACIP workgroups will map specific guidance and offer decision-making tools to health authorities that not only detail who the next phase groups are, but also when and how will they be notified and identified in order to improve outreach, close equity gaps, and maximize vaccine coverage. Centralized platforms to collect pre-registration of next phase recipients and provide rapid alerts when a vaccine becomes available to them are necessary tools to prevent wastage or delay. We must make every dose and every day count. With two vaccines now authorized and millions of doses on the way, we also must prepare effective communications to ensure that everyone lines up to receive their vaccine at the earliest time it's offered to them. A natural question when faced with two options is, which one is better? The available evidence suggests that both vaccines have equivalent safety and efficacy profiles in adults. I urge the CDC to stress in communications to the public that the products are comparable and that there is no reason to wait to favor one over the other. Common concerns people have expressed about COVID vaccines boil down to long-term safety, especially for a seemingly new technology. Public messaging highlighting the duration of clinical experience to date with the authorized vaccines and their individual components, including leveraging long-term and widespread clinical experience of current FDA-approved pegylated drugs and Moderna's prior clinical experience with their own platform would help improve public confidence in the safety of these vaccines. I thank the committee for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Dr. Joseph Bick. Good afternoon. My name is Joseph Bick and I'm an infectious diseases specialist who's serving as statewide director of healthcare services for the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. I appreciate the opportunity to speak regarding the importance of ACIP specifically prioritizing those who work and live in our nation's jails, prisons, and detention centers in the first phase of COVID vaccination. Over 2 million people are incarcerated in this country and over 500,000 individuals interact with them on a daily basis. Correctional officers, nurses, cooks, physicians, teachers, and others more than 260,000 inmates and 58,000 correctional employees have been diagnosed with COVID 
resulting in at least 85 employee and 1,700 inmate COVID-related deaths. The age-adjusted death rate due to COVID among the incarcerated is several fold higher than what is seen in the outside community. And case rates among both inmates and employees are significantly greater than those seen outside of incarcerated settings. Many of the largest recorded COVID outbreaks in this country have occurred in correctional facilities. Most inmates are housed in large, overcrowded, inadequately ventilated congregate living environments in which consistent physical distancing is not possible. Inmates are disproportionately people of color and often have multiple comorbidities that increase their risk for serious illness, hospitalization, and death. Delaying vaccine distribution to inmates will exacerbate the disparate racial impact of COVID-19. Age is one of the greatest predictors of poor outcome with COVID. The age-associated risk for prisoners begins to rise in their 50s. More than 10% of prisoners are 55 years of age or older. The ACIP recently recommended that initial vaccination should be offered to healthcare personnel and residents of long-term care facilities. The truth is that prisons are essentially long-term care facilities with bars. The California Department of Corrections developed the COVID risk score system that accurately predicts the likelihood that each inmate will be hospitalized if they become infected with COVID-19. Just 18% of our population accounts for 90% of hospitalizations and deaths. Targeted vaccination of a fraction of our inmate population could virtually end off-site hospitalizations. Correctional facilities are a major employer in some rural areas. When COVID is introduced by employees into these facilities, the disease is rapidly amplified, creating large outbreaks, which quickly overwhelm bed capacity in surrounding community hospitals not including correctional staff and high-risk inmates in phase one will result in preventable illness and death, additional burden upon local economies, and increased pressure upon overstressed community hospitals. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Jonathan Eisen. Mr. Eisen. Mr. Eisen, we'll come back to you. You may be having audio difficulties. Um, let me move on to- uh, I'm sorry, Mr. I'm here. I was on the phone, but apparently it's not working on the phone. So here I am. Can I go ahead? Go ahead, please. Good. Thank you very much. I'm Jonathan Eisen with the International Food Service Distributors Association. Uh, Mr. Eisen, we're unable to hear you. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, we can hear you. I'm sorry, I've <laughs> gone through this twice. Uh, but here I am. Anyway, I appreciate the opportunity today. I'm Jonathan Eisen with the National Food Service Distributors Association. And on behalf of our member companies, I would like to thank the CDC for giving me the opportunity to speak today on behalf of our industry. I'm asking the Advisory Council on Immunization Practices to ensure that the employees of this frontline essential industry are included in phase 1B in the next set of federally recommended guidelines. There are two separate supply chains distributing food products in the United States. IFTA represents food service distributors who provide the warehousing, transportation, and logistics support to ensure that fresh, safe food fills the kitchens of our nation's hospitals, nursing homes, schools, U.S. military, restaurants, and other food away from home operations. Food service distribution is a $303 billion industry and employs more than 350,000 people. There are 15,000 food service distribution center locations in the United States, which deliver 8.7 billion cases of food and other products annually. All of these businesses have continued to operate throughout the pandemic to ensure their customers have the food products they need. As food demand has grown, the industry has also worked closely with food banks and other nonprofits to provide food aid for hungry Americans. Food service distribution has been defined by the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security as an essential business during COVID-19 that is critical to the country's infrastructure. Distributors are frontline essential workers. They cannot work remotely and are on the ground in warehouses and delivering food and supplies in trucks. Even with the pandemic, a nationwide shortage of commercial truck drivers has meant that companies are still having difficulty finding and training the drivers they need to service their customers. A single driver coming down with COVID can create significant strain for a distributor's operation, often forcing them to delay or cancel deliveries. 
A nursing home facility, for example, must have the products that distributors deliver to feed their residents each day. Making the employees of the food service distribution industry a priority for vaccines will help ensure that they do. The Center for Disease Control has determined that frontline essential workers are one of the groups that should be considered for early vaccination if supplies are limited. Ensuring the continuing supply of food to American consumers and food service customers is a critical government responsibility, and including food service distributors in the next set of federally recommended priorities will send a strong signal that state vaccination plans must include the industry in their priority planning. It is critical that the men and women who work in the warehouses and drive the trucks to deliver these products can safely continue to fulfill their vital mission. The 350,000 hardworking Americans of the food service distribution industry have continued to come to work every day throughout the COVID-19 crisis to service their customers. They deserve to have their health protected. The committee must recommend that state vaccination plans make food service distributors a priority industry. Thanks very much and sorry about the problems at the beginning. And no apologies are necessary. Uh, Mr. Harold Schmidt. My name is Harold Schmidt, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at the University of Pennsylvania. I'd like to start by congratulating the committee members and especially also the staff again for their work under intensive line pressure and some quite confused media characterizations of central issues in recent days particularly. I'd like to highlight three points to do with limitations of promoting equity through face subpopulations alone, problems with rigid numeric age cutoffs, and the use of Tiberius. So first, I'm promoting equity through a phase system alone. Within each of the phase population groups, there's considerable variation, especially in terms of the risk of getting infected and the need of a vaccine for economic livelihood and other important considerations. The strongest line of defense against current criticism would be to align phasing more with the National Academies framework. And this includes specifically the recommendation that, quote, in each population group, vaccine access should be prioritized through CDC social vulnerability index or another more specific index, unquote. But given where we are, it certainly seems not too late to recommend the use of a disadvantage index, for example, in the clinical considerations that were mentioned earlier. Doing so would also align with the fact that at least 19 states are already using disadvantage indices for such and related purposes, especially also monitoring uptake that was rightly noted earlier today. Disadvantage index only increases in importance if, as is likely, the current phasing is kept, because neither public health nor equity has helped if a healthy 40-year-old film crew worker is offered a vaccine before disadvantaged 66-year-old grandmother living with multiple generations in a crowded setting. Second on rigid age cutoffs, as we said, as I said in an earlier ASAP committee meeting, the older we get, the more different we become. And especially if over 65 year olds are faced in parallel with essential workers, it's critical to be aware that while many older adults in this group can likely safely wait a few months for vaccines, others cannot, including minorities whom ASAP speaks to benefit by facing essential workers earlier. It's therefore important that the exemplary 66-year-old economically disadvantaged grandmother living with multiple generations in a crowded setting is offered a vaccine before a wealthy suburban retired couple or a 40-year-old healthy film crew worker. My colleague, Gubin Passat, submitted a written comment for ACS consideration with further details on problems with rigid age cutoffs and recommends that guidance to jurisdictions include a recommendation to adjust the age threshold by local differences and other overlapping sources of risk. Given jurisdiction planning as complex as it is, a pragmatic alternative would be, again, to recommend using a statistical measure of disadvantage that is likely to correlate quite well in line with state's current planning. And finally, it appears that technology can facilitate one element of promoting equity in a relatively straightforward way by integrating legally sound SVI or similar weights into the Tiberius software as an opt-out rather than an in option. Jurisdiction's autonomy will be preserved and chances that more disadvantaged communities face less scarcity would be increased. And ideally, we'd also use the same functions for centrally monitoring coverage rates across SBI sections. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Jeffrey Caballero. Mr. Jeffrey Caballero. Thank you. My name is Jeff Caballero on behalf of the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations, APCHO and our member community health centers and health organizations around the country, I thank you for the opportunity to submit a comment. APCHO is a national nonprofit association of 33 community health organizations, 28 are federally qualified health centers that advocate for the diverse health needs of medically underserved Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, providing culturally and linguistically appropriate care that are vital to supporting our communities through the COVID-19 crisis and every day. Asian Americans, Native Islands, and Pacific Islander communities must be a priority population. Recent data from the Kaiser Family Foundation show that Asian Americans are more likely to test positive 
for COVID-19, and they had the highest risk of hospitalization and death rates among race and ethnic groups. Similarly, the National Pacific Islander COVID-19 response team found that Pacific Islanders have the highest confirmed rates of COVID-19 in California, in King County, Washington, Clark County, Nevada, and the second highest case rate in the states of Utah, Oregon, Arkansas, and Colorado. Immigration status must not be a barrier to vaccine access. Since 2010, Asian Americans have been the fastest growing racial ethnic group in the United States. Today, 59% of all, of all Asians are foreign born. Federal law prohibits immigrants from accessing many health benefit programs such as Medicaid for the first five years of residing in the United States. With certain Pacific Islander communities from Micronesia, Marshall Islands, and Palau categorically ineligible under the law. Moreover, anti-immigrant policies such as public charge have made immigrant families, including many Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, fearful of seeking care out of fear that doing so could jeopardize the immigration status of their family members. Health centers are vital to reaching these communities of color and other hard hit communities. Community health centers serve approximately 28 million patients, of which 63% are racial and ethnic minorities, including 1.2 million Asian Americans and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander patients. As trusted members of the community, health centers are able to support individuals who are experiencing prejudice and racism in their communities, making them less scared to engage with healthcare providers. And health centers also provide critical enabling services, including in-language services and culturally appropriate care necessary to improving health outcomes for their patients. So in conclusion, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss these issues uh, and thank the committee for, um, uh, for listening. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, David Curry, Mr. David. I'm David Curry, president of the GEPP2 Global Foundation and head of its Center for Vaccine Ethics Policy and affiliate faculty in the Division of Medical Ethics at the NYU School of Medicine. Our foundation receives support from a range of individuals and organizations, including Moderna, Pfizer, and the Gates Foundation to support a free weekly digest of global immunization news. Our comment today focuses on the information to be presented to recipients and caregivers as they are offered or seek COVID vaccination. We argue that this information must be clearly presented for comprehension, be appropriately written and presented for limited literacy, numeracy, and reading levels, be broadly translated for the diverse populations that will need to be vaccinated, present alternative vaccine options as they become available, and be otherwise supportive of recipients in making a well-informed decision to accept or decline any vaccination, any vaccine offered. We recognize that the FDA's emergency use authorization does not require formal informed consent and that the information that is required is a fact sheet. But we must note that the EUA fact sheets are presented in text only with no graphical information to support comprehension and as important at a reading level that using the standard flesh Kincaid grade level assessment is ninth or 10th grade at least with a reading ease assessment as fairly difficult to difficult to read. As such, these fact sheets are simply not fit for purpose for many in the priority populations discussed today to support their informed decision about COVID immunization. So we energetically urge and are confident that CDC will extend and accelerate its best efforts to develop a range of graphically rich translated content to complement the fact sheets supporting informed uh, choice about COVID vaccination. In this spirit, we continue to be concerned that the CDC toolkit content now posted appears still to not have any content available to specifically support decision-making by residents of long-term care facilities who are of course now being vaccinated. Finally, we applaud the ACIP discussions today which noted the importance of vaccine confidence and trust especially in communities that face health access challenges. We believe strongly 
that the ability to make a well-informed decision about COVID immunization will be a critical driver to build and maintain such confidence and trust. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Min Tri Tu. Mr. Tu. Yes. Uh, actually, I'm female. Thank oh, you. Sorry. It's okay. Yeah, we did. I didn't indicate. My name is Ming Huang Trang Tu, and I am a family caregiver. I'd like to share our family experience to spotlight broader issues in our community. My mother, who you may hear in the background here, is 90 and was diagnosed with dementia six years ago. She moved in with me here in Seattle and I've been her primary caregiver since. She's now in advanced stages, is completely de dependent and needs 24 hour care. While I've often felt it couldn't get any more challenging, COVID has actually made it so. To protect her, other members of my family can't come give respite and I can't hire formal help given the risk of outsiders. I've also lost income since caregiving doesn't give me enough time to work. Above all, knowing that if she were infected, she'd likely not survive terrifies me. As a first generation Vietnamese refugee deeply involved in my community, and as an equity and community development professional, I also know that our communities are more likely to care for our elders at home due to lack of culturally appropriate care. We often don't put them in facilities because the system doesn't meet our needs. As a result, my home functions like a nursing home, but of one resident, and I'm a healthcare worker, just unpaid and unlicensed. Our communities also often have language barriers, which means less awareness and less ability to self-advocate. And because data on Asian Pacific Islanders is often aggregated, it masks the needs of specific subgroups, which we have seen with COVID. Taken together, these factors make communities like ours easily missed. In researching vaccine rollout via your committee's earlier analyses and our state's vaccine plan, my heart dropped because I couldn't see where we fit or when we'll be reached, leaving me worried we'll fall through the cracks. We already struggle with inequities in the long-term care system. Having to wait any longer for the vaccine adds to that. So recognizing the pivotal role of the committee, I'd urge you to take three critical actions. One, take a closer look at the 75 plus group and disaggregate the data. Use an equity lens to better understand racial and cultural inequities in it and the disproportionate toll on families in communities of color and refugee and immigrant groups. Two, prioritize elders in home-based, family-based care, especially those who are dependent and need skilled nursing care, which creates extraordinary burdens on their families. And three, include family caregivers as part of essential and or healthcare workers so that we might be afforded some relief. Thank you. Go ahead, Anna. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, Mr. John Scutellis, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. Mr. Scutellis? Yes, good afternoon. Um, my name is John Scutellis. I'm Vice President and National Director of Government Affairs for Waste Management Incorporated. Waste management is the largest solid waste collection, disposal, and recycling company in North America. We have operations in all 50 states. During the pandemic, we have worked hard to preserve the safety of our 50,000 employees. They, in turn, have worked hard under extraordinary circumstances to preserve the public health by, remove, by collecting and removing recyclables, medical, and solid waste. I also want to point out that my comments today are being made in coordination with the National Waste and Recycling Association, who submitted correspondence to the committee on December 18th, and with the Solid Waste Association of North America, who submitted comments to the CDC on November 30th. These two organizations represent tens of thousands of private and municipal solid waste and recyclable workers. During the COVID emergency, recycling and sanitation workers were recognized by Homeland Security as essential. I suggest that after healthcare workers, sanitation workers are the most essential workers. Removal of waste and recycling is the most basic part of preserving public health. 
The national papers have reported numerous instances where due to COVID sickness and necessary quarantining, municipal and private solid waste operations have been unable to put a full crew on the streets, resulting in garbage piling up and, un and unhealthy conditions. We also learned during the pandemic that recycling operations are, critical, are a critical part of the supply chain for toilet paper, paper towel, and other vital products. We asked the committee to specifically mention and recommend to the states that recycling and sanitation workers be given priority in the phase 1B vaccine distribution plans. Sanitation workers are, are vital to public health. Many are from minority communities or people of color or recent immigrants. They are perhaps the least recognized and appreciated of the essential workers. On behalf of waste management, the National Waste and Recycling Association and the Solid Waste Association of North America, we thank this committee for their work. We thank all of our essential workers for keeping us safe during this pandemic. And we urge the committee to recognize sanitation and recycling workers for priority distribution in phase 1B of the vaccine distribution. Thank you so much. Thank you for those comments. Um, our next speaker is Min Huang Tu. Mr. Amiz Tu. Hello. Yes, please go yes, ahead. Yes, hi. My name is James Tu, and I think there was some confusion on calling the name. Uh, um, go ahead, please. Yes, thank you for your time. My name is James Tu, and I'm here to ask you to consider the needs of minority elders in our communities. We often care for our older people and parents in our homes because of our cultural values. As children, we respect our parents and honor them by taking care of them when they get older. But sometimes that conflicts with American culture where older people are often put in nursing homes. When we don't do the same way, we become invisible to the system. My mother is being cared for at home and she needs the vaccine as soon as possible because she is at high risk, but she is not allowed access as part of group 1A and looks like may not be in group 1B either. I am very concerned if she has to wait until group 1C because if that is not until late spring or summer, that is too long. And that also put burden on my family members struggling to take care of my mom without any outside help and we need to provide her and them with relief as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Dr. Michelle Fiscus. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. I'm Dr. Michelle Fiscus, Medical Director of the Tennessee Vaccine Preventable Diseases and Immunization Program at the Tennessee Department of Health. Our office is primarily responsible for the allocation and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines across Tennessee. I would like to take a moment to join the others in thanking the members of the ACIP on their thoughtful deliberation around the recommendations for the use of the Pfizer and Moderna COVID-19 vaccines over the past several weeks. We all look to the ACIP for guidance for the safest and most appropriate use of all vaccines that are used in the United States. The 64 jurisdictional immunization programs were required to submit to CDC our initial plans for the allocation and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines, including the phasing of populations in mid-October. And while these are living and breathing documents that are constantly updated and revised, they are the framework we use to operationalize the delivery of vaccines and they were created after a thorough review of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine's framework for the equitable allocation of COVID-19 vaccines and the CDC's playbook for jurisdictions. 
Many of these plans were also informed by robust stakeholder groups that represent residents of the jurisdictions, especially underrepresented populations. As jurisdiction planning is informed by our own demographics, we best know and understand the challenges in our own, in our own jurisdictions. And many of us have chosen to focus on equitable allocation of vaccines that may not be addressed adequately by decisions made on the national level. So it's important to recognize that guidelines specifically around the prioritization of these resources might best be left to the jurisdictions to decide. I would ask that this extensive work of the jurisdictions be considered when ACIP enters into discussions around prioritizing populations to receive vaccines. Each time the committee votes to change these prioritized populations, jurisdictions are forced to make the choice to drastically change their vaccine distribution, administration, and communication planning when vaccines are literally en route to their administration sites or choose not to adopt the changes ACIP makes to the guidelines and proceed with the plans they've been working on for months. Obviously, this is not the position in which we would like to be placed during a time when jurisdictions are already working at capacity, media scrutiny is exceptionally high, and career public health officials are burning out. I know I speak on behalf of all jurisdictions when I commend you for the difficult work you are doing to ensure vaccines are used in the safest and most equitable way possible. I would also ask that you also carefully consider the downstream impact of the changes you vote upon today and as we move forward through the months ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next speaker is Patty Aldas Carrasco. Hello, my sister Patty has yielded her time to me. My name is Hector Aldaz, and I'm a research scientist in the biotechnology industry. I have a PhD in biophysics and have focused most of my professional career on developing antibody therapeutics and more recently, developing the next generation of molecular diagnostics. However, I'm here today speaking as a private citizen of Mexican descent in order to share my observation and concern regarding the omission of a highly vulnerable group from the prioritized list of COVID vaccine recipients. The group I'm referring to is composed of senior citizens who are both one, not independent, and two, under family home care. In Mexican culture, it's very common for elderly parents and grandparents to live with their children in multi-generational homes through end of life. This is a celebrated way of life and involves the particip participation of many family members, especially as the elders become less independent. This form of elder care requires a community and cannot be done at by an individual in isolation. Unfortunately, because of COVID, many of these caregivers are forced to choose between one, attempting to do the work of many on their own in order to minimize exposure risk, or two, sacrifice safety in order to help get help with caregiving or work to pay the bills. Nursing home placement is not a common option in my community, either because of cultural norms, prohibitive costs, or both. My father recently passed away at home due to a heart condition, and I had a firsthand glimpse of what caring for him at home would look like under COVID and without a vaccine. Long term, it would have been over overwhelming and unsustainable. The norms that I describe here are common across other Latino cultures. In addition, similar practices of elder care exist in Asian, Slavic, and likely many other cultures. Conversations with close friends and shared experiences with my significant other have taught me that these practices of elder home care are widespread and providing care under COVID in this manner is becoming unsustainable for many. I request that this group of seniors be distinguished from nursing home residents and the general 65 plus population and that they get prioritized for vaccination appropriately. The omission of this group from the priority list is striking to me. Again, I'm speaking of seniors who are both one, not independent, and two, cared for by family at home. Categorizing this group as high priority vaccine recipients will protect them while allowing their families to provide them culturally appropriate care. And the positive outcomes will likely be felt across multiple cultures. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you for your comment. Next is Dr. Susan Gould. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hello, I'm Susan Gould. I'm a professor of internal medicine and health management and policy at the University of Michigan. First, I want, like so many others, to personally and professionally thank all of you for the clear excellence and commitment you bring to this work. You're thoughtfully balancing risk of exposure, risk of severe infection, 
and the need to maintain basic social functions, including healthcare capacity. I hope my comments today, combined with the CDC's long and admirable history of engaging communities in deliberations about resource allocation in case of a pandemic, can contribute to equitable allocation and distribution of COVID vaccines. My own work with community partners focuses on justice issues and health and on increasing the voice of minority and underserved communities in policy decisions. Years ago, working on pandemic preparedness, I struggled with the question not whether to incorporate concerns for equity, but how. We know first come, first serve exacerbates inequity in healthcare and should avoid allocating vaccine that way, as you have done, as you have avoided, yes. Similarly, allocating solely based on age while appealing in simplicity and lately in the Twitter sphere, would worsen inequity due to pre-existing disparities in life expectancy. But how can we improve equity? The National Academies, whose guidance you have often quoted, suggested that equity cut across all phases of allocation, and that that's 1A through everything, and that federal, state, and local authorities could use the Social Vulnerability Index, or similar ways to provide a disproportionate share of vaccine to communities that have been disproportionately burdened by COVID. I strongly encourage you to include such a recommendation in your guidance. Well, as a health services researcher, I would welcome the opportunity to compare varied allocation and distribution methods on equity. As an ethicist, I would favor consistent standards and your guidance can help make that happen. Furthermore, while the phases of allocation you enumerate are morally and intellectually challenging enough, sub-prioritization, which you have talked about a great deal today within phases, would also benefit from your guidance. Perhaps social vulnerability could help providing hospitals in underserved areas with more vaccine, for instance, or vaccinating staff and residents of long-term care facilities in socially vulnerable areas first. If you want minority and underserved communities to trust in the vaccine distribution process, transparently recommending concrete ways to help them through this pandemic might help. In summary, I strongly encourage more explicit recommendations for both sub-prioritization and how to enhance equity. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Christopher Tu, Mr. Christopher Tu. Hi, my name is Christopher Tu. Um, as a public educator in the San Ramon Valley Unified School District, I've become accustomed to and quite frankly passionate about advocating for marginalized and underrepresented populations. But today, instead of talking about my students or my colleagues, I'd like to give voice to a population in my cultural community that will be directly affected by any decisions made in the prioritizing of recipients for forthcoming COVID-19 vaccinations. From a historical and cultural perspective, Southeast Asian families have a tendency to lean on one another and not government entities when they have needs. For example, my grandmother does not live in a care home. She lives with my aunt who has made many sacrifices to ensure that my banoi that not only continues to live in good health and safety, but also with a high quality of life for her remaining years. This is the norm for many multi-generational families that live, exist across America. What the system cannot provide for them, they provide for themselves. But therein lies the systemic inequity. By not living in a care facility with a licensed nurse, someone such as my grandmother and aunt, who for all intents and purposes live in a care home and in a patient caregiver relationship, may not check every systemically derived box necessary to con be considered high priority for a vaccination. This all because they, like many of these underrepresented families, choose to work as hard as they can before becoming a burden to others or to ensure that their appropriate needs are met. Obviously, these communities cannot rely on each other for vaccinations. So this is a critical moment where they must lean on the government and local agencies for support. In this process, it is imperative that we ensure that the decisions made and any required proverbial checkboxes do not lead to further marginalization of this outgroup. I don't think anyone can disagree that the last nine months have taken some form of socio-emotional toll on everybody. To deprive elderly and their family member caretakers access to a vaccine further separates their level of support compared to the population norm. As one final example, if unvaccinated, these households cannot safely bring in other family members for support like vaccinated healthcare workers could without putting themselves, others, and those they care for at further risk. 
As a call to action, I ask that critical reflection be taken to consider whether or not the criteria used to prioritize vac vaccines are truly equitable. My Bonoi represents just one of the many families that consist of the silent minority of elderly who receive long-term care from family members in a private home, and their positions need to be considered when further subdividing what specific groups qualify for phases 1A, 1B, and 1C. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, our final speaker is Dr. Monica Peek. Dr. Peek? Yes. Um, thank you so much for having me. I am a primary care physician um, on the south side of Chicago. I work at the University of Chicago. I'm also a health disparities researcher and a bioethicist. Um, I'm the director of research at the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. Um, I'm talking today on behalf of myself and also uh, Govin Prasad. He is a lawyer, um, a, a, a legal professor at the University of Denver College of Law and we are both uh, part of the Greenwell, uh, Greenwell Foundation. Um, our previous work on prioritization of COVID vaccines in JAMA was recently cited by the ACIP, and we hope that our further comments today on this topic will be helpful to you. Um, I'd like to first just start by expressing our gratitude and thanks um, to the ACIP for your thoughtful, extremely thoughtful deliberations and work thus far. Um, and uh, your proposed prioritization of essential workers in phase 1B and people with um, high-risk medical conditions uh, for phase 1C. Um, our comments today um, really are expressing concern about the equity and benefit of using a single age threshold, initially 65 and now 75 as a one-size-fits-all population-wide prioritization criterion, um, and uh, particularly how that has impact around um, equity um, for many populations, but particularly for racialized minority populations. Um, because of structural inequities, structural racism um, in this country, uh, racialized minorities age differently. They uh, physiologically age differently and have, as a result, shorter lifespans in, uh, for many reasons, including a, an increased burden of chronic disease. So if you take a 70-year-old white man that may be the equivalent of a 55-year-old African-American man, um, and we've seen differences um, in just the distribution curve of COVID play out um, amongst racial and ethnic minorities, so that for um, white persons, 13%, uh, only 13%, of COVID deaths have been amongst people who are under 65. So the vast majority have been for people who are 65 and older, but that has not been the case for uh, Latinx people uh, or black people, where 35% and 30% respectively have uh, constituted COVID deaths. And so the, um, the burden of COVID mortality that we're seeing in minority communities um, has shifted to a much younger population um, than, we, than what we are seeing in the non-minority population. And so that it's important, I think, for us to be thinking um, not just as age as a- Your time has expired. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so I wanna thank the public uh, comment speakers uh, for taking the time to address us. Again, I wanted to restate that um, we, take these comments very seriously um, and value them. So um, we'll take a 10 minute break here um, and then we will return uh, to discuss uh, the motion on the table. So we will return at 15 minutes after the hour. Thank you. <laughs> 